think I'm very much giving like Ina Garden, Coastal Grandma uh, <laughs> in this, like Coastal Grandma at Easter, like Ina Garden making her roast chicken for everyone on <laughs> Easter. And it was just like through the grapevine, like people were just like, did you hear? Did you know? Have you heard? You know when you're making a pie crust and you fold it like kind of into a quadrant and then you transport it and then you unfold it to like make sure it doesn't rip or it doesn't stretch or you know it's just like a mode of transportation hey everyone welcome back to my channel my name's jackie and this is jackie is making a place where I talk all about the knitting and sewing that I'm doing to create more sustainable fashion and home decor. Today I have for you just a normal podcast episode. I'm going to be walking through my most recent finished object. Then I'm going to show you one of the whips that I actually cast on a few days ago. And then lastly, I have a new acquisition to show you some brand new yarn that's made its way into my stash for a new spring knit. Okay, so what I have to share with you first is my finished object, the Lana Vest, and I'm actually wearing it right now. I've been lovingly calling this my Key Lime Pie Lana Vest. Um, when I saw out to cast on something kind of springy this winter, I was looking for different colors that I thought might suit this vest. I had originally saw this vest on Instagram and my friends and I had been like sharing it back and forth. I also saw Amy of Knee Knits making it. Um, she made it out of this like really gorgeous burgundy color, but I knew I wanted something fun and springy. And so initially I was thinking of maybe a blue. Um, and then I kind of got my eyes on this green color. So this color in particular is called Leek. And this is the Kins & Co Osprey yarn. And this color is actually being discontinued. So if you see it anywhere, snag it up. Um, it's kind of hard to find, but yeah, it's a very unique color. So in some lights, it can look like that really bright lime green. And then in some, it can look a little bit more cool toned and mellow and pastel. It really all depends on where I'm at. I think I'm very much giving like Ina Garden, Coastal Grandma uh, <laughs> in this, like Coastal Grandma at Easter, like Ina Garden making her roast chicken for everyone on <laughs> Easter. Um, so yeah, I'm, this is like, you know, a basic, easy, what your mind goes to when you think of like sweater vest type of outfit. I'm interested to see other sort of outfit pairings I'll figure out to wear with this. Um, this is also something I want to get better at. Like when I'm preparing to knit something, what are outfits that I foresee myself like pairing it with or designing around it? Um, and just being like a little bit more intentional in that way. Um, because sometimes, at least for me, I can see a yarn or see a pattern and just want to cast it on just because it's special and it feels exciting and unique in that moment. And, and sometimes it is, but sometimes I think for me, a good lesson for myself would just be to slow down and to really think through like, how is this piece going to fit into my wardrobe? And so this one in particular, I don't know how well this is going to fit into my wardrobe. Um, but I've, been kind of doing what I just said in reverse, where now that I have this piece, what are outfits that I can create to wear with it? Um, so if you guys have any ideas, please let me know. I'd love to think of how you would would pair this outfit. Like, what would you do? What would you wear it with? Um, I've been thinking, you know, under or over, I mean, a dress, I think would look really cool. Even like a sleeveless dress. Um, I've been thinking if I got, or if I made myself, um, a patterned blouse, so like kind of a ditzy floral pattern blouse, I think that would be a really cool, like texture pattern mixing. Um, I've also seen where people take like an elastic band. Um, I know there's like a popular TikTok brand. It's called the Tucky. Um, you can also get them like knockoff versions on Amazon. Um, I'm also thinking I could literally just sew myself a piece of elastic and just like put it around my waist. Um, and then you're able to tuck up your sweaters or in this case, a sweater vest. 
Um, and to just like more accentuate your waist, if you will. So yeah, I'm thinking about either over a dress or I do have um, some fabric and a pattern I'm thinking about making a jumpsuit in. This might be kind of cute, like over a sleeveless jumpsuit. Um, I'm also thinking for more casual, maybe just over like a white t-shirt with some like light wash denim. So, so yeah, I have all of these ideas, but nothing really set in stone. But again, I'm having to work backwards because I didn't think of this initially. So that's something that I'm going to try to do moving forward and maybe is a helpful tip for you guys. Some other details about this vest are I made this in the size two. For reference, I have a 38 inch bust and you'll see in the video that I insert, um, it is a fairly oversized vest. So if you're gonna cast it on, definitely keep in mind that amount of positive ease and then just the yarn that you're gonna be using. Make sure to knit a swatch and block it. I was aware that my swatch was gonna grow quite a bit. So that's something that I kept in mind um, as I was knitting this. Um, and one thing I actually did in particular because of that was I knit one whole repeat less. So um, I actually, this is supposed to have, let's see, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It says seven diamonds down the front. These are like the row repeats. And it's actually supposed to have eight. And then it's supposed to have seven centimeters worth of ribbing at the bottom. And I just knew that was gonna be far too long on me. Once I tried it on and saw where this was hitting, I knew it was gonna grow at least two more inches. So I decided to omit the last repeat. And then I decided to do the ribbing at just the same amount of stitches that is on the ribbing on the sleeves and on the collar. So, and I love the way that turned out. Um, I think if you are somebody that is taller, I'm pretty average height, I'm 5'6", but I do feel like maybe in my proportions I have a smaller torso. Could just be me, but that's, that's a little bit how I feel. It could also be that I'm used to wearing high-waisted pants um, and not having shirts that go like past my bottom. Um, so yeah, that was the decision that I made. I also omitted the, um, the, what's it called? I was gonna say the cut. What is it called? <laughs> I also omitted the like hem divide. I'll put on the screen, I'll figure this out. Um, from the pattern, just because I am the type of person I like to like French tuck my shirts, I like to tuck things up. And because I have a wider hip, I find, this is what it's called, a split hem. I find that if it has a split hem that it can tend to just like either look really funny if I tuck it in or just accentuate my hips in a way that isn't my preferred way of accentuating them. So yeah, I decided to omit the split hem. I do, however, think the split hem is absolutely beautiful. It looks so pretty with the braid. Um, and so if you are somebody that likes that style and look, I absolutely think you should do it. It looks so pretty. Um, but yeah, for me, this is kind of what worked just for my size and, and what I think would look best on my body type. So those were the particular changes I made. The only other changes I made in the actual construction of the garment are just that I knit left-handed. So everything I do is mirrored to a right-handed knitter, meaning I knit left to right. And so anything that I'm doing, any of the left cables, I actually make right cables. And when I'm doing the instructions for picking up the right hand side, I'm actually picking up the left hand side. So those are just things that I kept in mind. Um, one other note I have here is once I joined in the round, the double seed stitch um, or moss stitch is um, switched. Like once I get to the opposite, let's see, the double stitch is opposite what the right handed direction is. So this is another thing I just wanted to mention for this pattern is I don't think it would be necessarily a good beginner pattern just because there are certain things and certain skills I think that 
you come into contact with as you're going through this. So this was my first cabled pattern. Um, and I actually do think it's fine for a first cabled pattern, but you want to have some knitting under your belt just because there are certain times where you really need to be comfortable with reading your knitting. Um, and I think that one of the times is when you're reading the seed or moss stitch, um, you're just really wanting to make sure you're on the right row for it. And then if you ever need to tink back or ladder down, uh, there are like three different times I had to do cable surgery <laughs> and go back down, either add a cable or switch the way a cable was going. Um, it can just be a little bit finicky. And if you've never done it before, it's like, holy crap, I have to really think through, okay, this, I have to go four rows down and then you have to, like just the way that you're knitting into it, the way that you're fixing, if, you know, the way that you're fixing any knit stitches as you're laddering down is a learning curve. And I would say adding and fixing a cable, it's one of those where you're just like, okay, I need to like think through this before as before and as I'm doing it. And then when you do it, you're like, heck yeah, like I'm so smart. I just figured that out. Yes. Um, but as you're doing it, you just like, like I couldn't talk to anybody. I needed to be like in my focus mode, going through the steps. And I think if you're comfortable with knitting, it's not hard. You're just, you have to think through it. But if you're not comfortable with knitting, and if you, especially if you're not comfortable with reading your knitting, um, I would recommend getting to a place where you are comfortable with that before you would do a cabled or just like an extra textured knit. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. I'm trying to think through anything else you guys might find interesting in terms of this vest. Yeah, I don't think any other notes on this in particular, just that, you know, it grows a lot. It is um, a big oversized piece, which I think is very communicated through the pictures. Um, but just to keep in mind, um, as you're making it and as you're blocking it, it's one of those items you have to be very careful when you block. I noticed the second I lifted it out of the water, this yarn went from being so bouncy to like stretch and I was like, no. So I just took extra care to wring it out. Um, you know, it's almost like, you know when you're making a pie crust and you fold it like kind of into a quadrant and then you transport it and then you unfold it to like make sure it doesn't rip or it doesn't stretch or, you know, it's just like a mode of transportation. That is what I find the best method is for me when I'm blocking is I just, I'm very gently like folding it up into a space that I can transport it and then I'm unfolding it in that same sort of regard. So, so yeah, this honestly took almost like two full days to dry. It's a very heavy, um, this isn't air and weight yarn. So it, it definitely took a while. And then once it was, I would say 98% there, I took it upstairs this morning and let it finish drying in the sunshine. And then I got to put it on. So, so yeah, this in particular, it, it's just, it was a very, I would say labor intensive knit, I feel super accomplished just because I've never done cables before. Um, I've even never really like done anything like textured like this before. Um, and so I just feel really accomplished that it is finished because it's something that like you had to think through when you were working through it. It was never just like, oh, I'm gonna sit down and knit tonight. It was always a process. I always had to have my pattern with me working through it. Um, I did want to note, I did use all of the written instructions for this pattern. She does supply you with the charts as well. So that I found awesome. Whether you prefer the charts or the written instructions, you can choose whatever adventure you like and go that way. Um, but yeah, it was never just a sit down and knit sort of knit. It was always a process, um, which made me feel like it took longer than I wanted it to, but yeah, I just, I feel so accomplished with it. I'm so excited that it's done and I'm excited to wear it. It makes me happy. You know, it's like, I have green eyes. So I feel like when I wear green, it's just, it feels like so me. So yeah, that's everything I have for the Lana vest. 
if you've made it before or if you're interested in making it or again if you have any outfit ideas for me let me know down in the comments below okay so next i have for you an update on my cumulus blouse so last time i talked with you i told you all about the yarn that i'm using for this and that is the Sorella yarn. It is a hand dyed yarn um, and I'm using both the mohair and the Surrey lace. And this is from the Gilmore Girls collection. Show it to you guys up close. You can really see the difference here. So this is the mohair and this is the Surrey. So the mohair took the color just ever so slightly more. And this is in the color I'm all in. Um, if you're familiar with the show, you would know what scene that comes from. And this I'm making the Cumulus Blouse by Petite Knit. And I just cast this on this past weekend. We're already getting a little tangled here. <laughs> um, you can see here, this is what we've got going. You can see my raglan increases there on the sides. And this beautiful, super fuzzy fabric. This is the type of fabric that I'm probably gonna sneeze a million times <laughs> while I'm making this. Um, it just feels so, so light and feathery. Cumulus like a cloud. Um, this in particular, I just knew I wanted to cast on, oh my gosh, I'm already getting <laughs> fibers in my mouth. This in particular, I knew I wanted to cast on this spring. This pattern just screams spring to me. Um, and so I cast it on actually while I was at a coffee shop with my friends and I was so glad I did. Um, it just reminded me of the need for fiber friends for a knitting community because sometimes you're gonna run into problems that you can't necessarily Google or you know, sometimes you can f go through the Ravelry comments or some of the project pages, but sometimes it's just faster to have friends nearby. And this was one of those instances because as I was casting on in, I went into the second row, Petite Knit recommended that you like do so many stitches and then you do a raglan increase and then you do so many stitches and then you do a raglan increase. And the paragraph above it said, raglan increases are either make one less or make one rights, um, depending on where you are. And so I was reading it and I was reading the second sentence to do a raglan stitch. And I just assumed like I was supposed to know whether to go left or right and to do it. And so I did the whole row, um, just kind of guesstimating. I even asked my friends like, which way do you think I should go? And I got to the end and I had four stitches left and I was like, how? And now in retro retrospect, it makes like perfect sense why, what I was missing. But I was so grateful that I had my friend Kaylee and Sarah to talk to, to be like, what the heck did I do? And Kaylee was like, no, that for the raglan increase, you were just supposed to knit it and you weren't supposed to increase yet. Your increases come later where she actually specifies the make one left and the make one right. So I, yeah, it was just a moment where I was like, oh, well, I mean, why? I, first of all, I don't know why she wouldn't just say slip marker, knit one slip marker, because that's, that's literally what you're doing. I understand that that in particular is the raglan increase stitch, but yeah, I just, I think that if you were new, you might not know that yet. Um, if you're me and you're not technically new anymore, you still might not know that yet. Um, but yeah, it was one of those moments where I was like, oh my gosh, thank you guys. Like, I don't know, was it a blonde moment? I don't know. Um, but it was one of those where I was like, okay, yeah, you're right. That was it and fixed it immediately, got going. So, so yeah, I think now I'm in, let's see, maybe my fourth round of increases. I have to get to like, I think 14 rounds and then and then it might be then it's joining the round time and then I do a little bit more and then I split for sleeves so after working on this you guys like this is going to fly by I already know it um, I actually have a guild meeting tonight so I live in Madison Wisconsin and we have one of the biggest knitting guilds in the entire country um, and I go a little bit early, so I'm gonna get in lots of knitting time tonight. 
So I'm really excited. I'm gonna put a little progress keeper on here so I can keep you guys updated um, on how fast we go with next week's, um, or I guess in two weeks, my next podcast episode, you can see how far I get with this. But yeah, this is something I can't wait to wear this spring. So I'm so excited to work on it. Um, I will mention I had a slight bit of a fright <laughs> um, because I realized like, I don't know why I didn't even think about this, but um, mohair often has a lot more yardage than Surrey. So this mohair has about like 450 yards. Like this is a lot of yardage in the mohair, but the Surrey only has like 330 yards. So according to the mohair yardage, like I would have plenty for this blouse, but I'm a little bit worried if I'm gonna have enough of the Surrey. So if this ends up being like a three quarter length sleeve, that would be why. So we'll see how that all pans out, but I'm really hoping I have enough yarn because obviously that's hand dyed. I can't get it again. So we'll see. We cross our fingers and see. Okay. And lastly, I have an acquisition to share with you guys. And this is kind of a fun story because I've been wanting to try knitting for Olive for a really long time. Um, I'm actually reading this book right now. It's called To Die For. And I think I actually might do another video on this just because it's so interesting to learn about not only how fibers can impact us and our health, like plastics and all of that, but also the dyes that are used, how those can impact us. And so when I've been looking at yarn brands in particular, it's been really cool to learn a little bit more about Knitting for Olive learn about all of their sustainability practices, but then also learn that their dyes are all Ocotec certified, um, which if you're not familiar, I'll put something up on the screen that just like describes what that is. But yeah, because of those things, I've just been really intrigued by the brand, but it is a little bit harder to get here in the States. Um, like you just, either have to order it from a shop that carries it, or you, I mean, you could order it from Knitting for Olive, but then you're paying um, like a pretty hefty shipping free just because it is a company that is abroad. Let's see if it says where this is from. I, I know it's from a Nordic country. I'm just not exactly sure which one. I'll have to put that up on the screen. Um, but there was like, a little bit of buzz going around my knitting groups in town that one of my favorite stores, one of my favorite yarn stores in town was going to be getting knitting for Olive. And it was just like through the grapevine. Like people were just like, did you hear? Did you know? Have you heard that this place might be getting knitting for Olive? <laughs> it's like, really? Oh my gosh. Because, you know, for me, I would have either had to like drive into Minnesota or yeah, pay for a shipping fee, whatever. I was on Instagram one night and I saw my yarn shop post, hey, we're getting some new yarn. Everybody make a guess what it is. Um, so many people put this guess in the comments and then the next day they revealed it's live on the site. And all they have right now is the pure silk and the heavy merino. Um, but immediately, and I mean immediately, I went and grabbed, I have like a gift card from Christmas time for this yarn store. Immediately went and grabbed it and placed an order. Um, I like was quick looking up on Ravelry. Like I knew a couple of spring patterns I was interested in that use the Knitting for Olive Pure Silk. Um, and so I, I couldn't fully decide on which pattern I wanted, but I chose between two and I needed about the exact same yardage for the two kind of springy t-shirts I was looking at. Um, and so I placed an order for the Knitting for Olive Pure Silk and this is in the colorway cream. So you can see here. This is 100% pure silk. Let's make sure you guys aren't blown out. There you go. It's really different than anything I've ever worked with. Um, this is a fingering weight yarn. And yeah, you can tell it's it's um, not wool, basically. 
Um, it just has a different sort of feel. It, it almost feels like cotton, um, but s silkier because it is silk. Um, but yeah, I was thinking about like a spring sort of short sleeve top that I would like. And I thought cream would be like a really great staple. If you guys have been following me, you know that I've been knitting with a bunch of really bright colors. Um, and so this is kind of a nice little palette cleanser, something I can wear with a ton of different outfits. So, so yeah, so right now I'm kind of deciding between just like a basic knit t-shirt or something that has like some ribbing and a button up. Um, I'm kind of leaving, leaning towards just like the, the everyday plain white tee. I think I would get so much use out of it. I was also saying, I think this color is going to be great because if it ever did get like dingy or, you know, lose its whiteness, I could either one bleach it or I could over dye it another color. So uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm really excited about the potential of this. I'm excited to share with you guys how I like working with a different type of fiber. Um, if I'm okay working with this type of fiber. Um, and just like how it's going to feel next to my skin once things warm up. I'm really excited about that. So, so yeah, that was my really fun acquisition. I have a couple of other things I'm thinking about getting. So stay tuned for that in the next episode as well. Um, I am going to continue working on my banana sweater, that Paul vest. Um, right now my two main projects are going to be that cumulus blouse and the Paul sweater. And I'm going to kind of be working through those. Um, I also have some really fun sock yarn coming in the mail. I am going to try it again with a new needle that I'm going to be trying. So that's something I'm going to be discussing with you guys as well. Those are all the things that are to come. Um, but thank you guys so much for hanging out with me this week. As always, I'm so grateful for any moment that you guys spend with me. If you are new here and you're not subscribed yet, please, please, please subscribe. I'm so, so close to a thousand subscribers and it would just mean so much to me if you liked this video, if you enjoyed watching and if you subscribed and maybe left a comment down below on what you worked on while you were watching this. I hope that you guys have a great rest of your week and I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye-bye.